All right, we can probably go ahead and get kicked off. And if a couple people are joining late, that's okay. We do record these events, so people can always go back and check it out on YouTube if they missed anything. But um, this is Marco with Harper DB, just doing quick introductions. We'll have um, Jake Cohen from Harper DB doing a quick intro on Harper DB technology and the company. And then we'll be passing it over to Brett from Google to um, kind of lead the whole live stream here to discuss DevOps best practices and discuss deploying HarperDB on Anthos and Kubernetes. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, if you do have any questions along the way, feel free to post them either in the Q&A at the bottom or in the chat either is completely fine. And we can address them as we go along or at the Q&A portion at the end. So um, without further ado, I'll pass it over to you guys to get started. Right, if you want to go to the next slide, I'll do a quick HarperDB introduction here and then turn it over to you. All right, so thanks everyone for joining. Uh, a lot of you are familiar with HarperDB, but for those who aren't, I like to go over some quick features here. Uh, HarperDB is built by developers for developers. It's a powerful but easy to use database solution designed to make your life easier. Uh, so talking through these various things here, our storage algorithm is one of the secret sauce under the hood of HarperDB here. All content is indexed by default. So every single attribute of every table will automatically be indexed. This is not something you need to do from a DBA side. HarperDB handles it. That's going to make sure that queries are fast and efficient and return in a quick, uh, quick manner there. The dynamic schema, uh, that's also part of the secret sauce. So that means you don't need to define data types or data model ahead of time. As your data is ingested into HarperDB, the schema will automatically update to match uh, what your metadata looks like. So that's part of the NoSQL side where you can get data in just like a document store, but we wanted to add some SQL functionality on top of that since developers are familiar with it and it's quite powerful to join data together. Uh, so I always like to say we blend the worlds, take the Venn diagram of relational and non-relational databases, take that middle part that's good at, at everything and put it together into one single product. So you can ingest NoSQL data uh, in more of a document fashion in JSON and then immediately go ahead and query utilizing joins in SQL to pull that data together. Uh, and that's any field on any table can be joined together because they're all indexed by default. We provide a built-in HTTP, HTTPS API. So very web-based fashion, everything you can do to access HarperDB is done through our REST API. Uh, but we do provide drivers as well. So ODBC, JDBC, uh, we even have an Excel add-in. Uh, but for the most part, developers will utilize that REST API uh, in their applications. We have PubSub data replication. So between HarperDBs, uh, data is replicated using publish and subscribe settings. Uh, it's bi-directional and at a table level. So you can go in and define how you want your data replicated, where you want your data replicated, and everything in between. Finally, we have a self-service studio. This is studio.harperdb.io. It is a web-based portal that you can go ahead and deploy and manage all of your HarperDB instances. So it allows you to manage your HarperDB cloud instances, your local instances. I run one on my laptop here, uh, and the studio lets me manage all of them, access the data, define uh, new tables, new schemas, set up users' roles, uh, and soon HarperDB functions. That's something that I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. Uh, next slide, please. So a quick architectural overview of HarperDB. We are written in Node.js. That does not mean you have to use Node.js. As long as you have a, access to a REST, you can use whatever language you'd like. Uh, but we leverage NPM. So you can use NPM to install HarperDB anywhere you like. Uh, I do that on my laptop, like I said. You can put it on a server or really even a Raspberry Pi. Anything you want that can run Node.js, HarperDB can run on. It's extensible and modular, vertically and horizontally scalable. So that's really good for uh, deploying onto multiple servers, but we can also scale vertically onto more powerful servers uh, either way. And finally, we're contain container friendly. Uh, obviously that's important for today's discussion here. Uh, let me walk through a little bit on the right side as well, what the architecture looks like. Going from bottom to top here, HarperDB uh, utilizes LMDB, which is a key value store. That is at the underlying data persistence layer, but then we layer our, uh, again, our secret sauce on top of it. So you have the HarperDB storage algorithm. That's that dynamic schema, uh, automatic indexing and everything there. And then the core services on top of that, that's your CRUD operation. So create, read, uh, update, delete of your data. On top of that, we utilize a lot of the different Node.js libraries out there to add features and functionality for you. 
Uh, on top of that, we have SQL, NoSQL, CSV. This is the different ways to interact with the data. So all of it comes down to the exact same underlying data model there, uh, but you can access the data however you like. So you can insert data in SQL, get it with NoSQL, vice versa, uh, however you prefer. And then the ways to access those is through the REST API or WebSockets. WebSockets is what we use to cluster and to do that PubSub replication I was just talking about, but we also have uh, some packages out there that you can utilize WebSockets to effectively have a, a reader on the table and automatically grab updates. On top of that is the various SDKs, drivers, client apps, uh, anything that accesses HarperDB. So the studio is actually just a big client application that utilizes uh, HarperDB functions. So talking a little bit more about those containers that we were mentioning there, uh, HarperDB's architecture naturally fits containerization paradigms. Requirements are simple. You need Linux, a file system, and Node.js and other common dependencies. HarperDB's application is completely abstracted from the data. So that means that all user and configuration data is stored in a single directory and you can put that on persistent storage. Uh, but because the application is separate, you can spin it up and spin it down as necessary in your container. Uh, application and dependencies can be run entirely in an ephemeral container. So like I said, you can spin it up and down when you need it. Uh, and unlike some traditional databases, HarperDB does not have special infrastructure requirements. We will run on pretty much anything. Uh, you obviously need persistent storage, but that's about it. Uh, this talk is focused on containerization. So something that's been really important to HarperDB in the past year is that containerization journey. Uh, we've been focused on containerizing and deployment here at HarperDB. It's a top priority for us. Uh, working with Brett and others has been awesome. And we're actively working with them to make HarperDB more and more efficient in the containerization uh, in the containerization space. So HarperDB 3.1.0, that's the release due in the next few weeks. And it's going to include some of these features that we've learned uh, and really improved on. So HarperDB will be able to be installed with uh, various parameters that can all be passed via container environment variables. That's something we've heard from our experts would be really helpful for them. Uh, as well, all, all HarperDB configuration settings can be set on install. So that way when you're deploying, everything's set and ready to go. Uh, we've also added the ability con to configure whether HarperDB will log to standard out and standard error or to a log file. Currently, it is only a log file, uh, but to follow more containerization standards, we will allow for standard out and standard error. That's coming soon, uh, next couple of weeks, like I said. Uh, I'm sure we'll have some more updates to make on our containerization journey here. It's a top priority for us, and we are excited to continue down that path. Next slide. Uh, so finally, this is related to deployments, uh, and I do want to talk about it just a little bit, uh, distributed applications. HarperDB is out there. We, uh, we're talking to people all the time with various different use cases, uh, and what we want to do is help reduce latency by shifting APIs to the edge. Now, what does that mean? A common pattern we've seen when talking to customers uh, and just technologists out there is databases end up in a single geographic region. Uh, they can scale vertically, but then they, they have just more and more usage requirements. Uh, obviously, if it's in one place, the latency of the internet takes place too. So you have to, to get the data back and forth. That can take some time and hard to reach geos. Uh, and obviously, infrastructure bottlenecks create uh, ballooning costs. This is a pattern we've seen across many giant companies that are that have their act together. And still, um, they're relying on a single geo and a single database. So what's the solution? The solution is to get data out to the edge distribute APIs and data storage. So a lot of times APIs will be distributed, but the data storage won't be. It'll be in a monolith database back in a cloud. So we want to be able to bring that to the edge, shift the application logic and the database to the edge. Uh, remove bottlenecks of infrastructure costs, get data onto uh, data centers wherever they may be. Uh, and HarperDB makes that easy by utilizing that pub sub replication to move your data where you need it. This uh, results in reduced latency and reduced costs uh, and improve performance, all good things. So some use cases that we're doing this in is gaming, uh, social interactions like friends, rewards, rankings. These are something that you want fast uh, and gamers don't like latency. So bringing that out to the edge is something that really helps them. E-commerce, uh, identifying and stopping scammers and bots. That's There's all kinds of e-commerce cases where there's scammers trying to make some money layering on top of sales drops, whatever it might be. Being able to identify those quickly uh, is really important. Media, pirate identification and elimination. So anybody who's pirating, you want to be able to gather those quickly and identify those and solve that problem. 
military as well, situational awareness. There's all sorts of sensor data that needs to be collected um, and that data needs to be gathered somewhere. So having that in the database on the edge. Uh, the common pattern here in these use cases that HarperDB solves well is that they're heavily distributed and read and write heavy. Um, so having reads and writes on the edge is really important. A lot of times you can have caching solutions that will read, but then those writes uh, are still a problem. So having end users hit the instances that are closest to them, return quickly with HarperDB speed, uh, and the edge data center being physically closer to them results in a much improved user experience. Uh, another feature coming that I do want to mention is HarperDB functions. So in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be releasing the container-friendly HarperDB updates. And then following that, in the next few months, will be HarperDB functions, where you can write your API logic directly into HarperDB. It's going to be kind of like Lambdas, but in our database. So you'll have direct access to HarperDB. You can write Node.js, deploy it into HarperDB, and run and define your APIs at the edge. And I think I've rambled on enough. And with that, I will turn it over to Brett. All righty. Hello, everybody. Uh, so first and foremost, uh, Jake, Margaret, thank you for hosting and uh, letting Google participate in tonight's session. Um, my name is Brett Mitchell. I am a principal architect at Google in our TME group, which is uh, Telco Media and Entertainment. Um, I am a 30 plus year veteran of um, the space going back into the early days of telco in the 90s. Um, and most recently have been on a cloud journey since about 2005, um, obviously starting off with um, other uh, in the early days and have um, recently joined Google um, as the cloud that Google is providing um, is kind of finally come to this best of breed and all these things coming together for modern cloud here in what I would call cloud 2.0. Uh, and it was a real exciting opportunity to join the company last year and uh, have, uh, in doing so, and I think Margo may have mentioned this, I apologize for the audio issues I was having earlier, uh, but uh, we have a common customer um, that ultimately introduced uh, Harper and Google together um, to facilitate a uh, specific point workload for. Um, and that kind of got this conversation going about when you're talking about extensible cloud and something like Harper, what is the right platform? And the answer is there isn't one. Um, it's wherever it needs to be. And can something like Google, Google and Google's containerization strategy really help with that? Uh, and so we've been working on that um, together, sharing advice and ideas. Uh, and we wanted to share with the community a little bit about what Google's offering looks like in the container space um, and uh, see if it's anything that might meet your workload needs uh, as a community. So um, with that, I will dig in here. Um, so when kind of comparing and contrasting, before we get into container, containerization and talking about this cloud versus that cloud or multi-cloud, uh, we really need to start with a look at the network. And I, so I just want to share some of the feature sets of Google's uh, network that underlies our cloud product and how it was designed and how that's important. So traditionally, uh, when you look at the other cloud providers that are out there um, and kind of go back and take about a 15 year perspective, uh, you ended up with regional virtual private clouds. So you might have a cloud in a virtu virtual private cloud in the West, and you might have a virtual private cloud in the East, and they really are separate and segmented from each other. And if you want those two networks to talk to each other, you actually have to transit the internet or create complicated pieces of uh, expensive peering in order to be able to connect the, the dots between those two environments. Um, contrast that with Google's approach, um, there are benefits to having come into the cloud space a little later, as we were able to actually both mature our own internal product and turn it into a public offering and also watch what was working well and what we believed could be done better in the market outside. And the way that we operate our VPCs inside of Google Cloud is that they are global. So your point of view within a single VPC, which is where you manage all your network infrastructure, is a global view. Now you can isolate things and control rules and things on a regional or zonal basis, but the actual footprint is a single uh, uh, VPC on a global basis. 
Additionally, at the subnetting level, our entire global network is essentially a extremely high premium layer two network with software defined layer three on top of it. And what that allows us to do is dynamically within a region allocate the IPs across a subnet across zones. So instead of being stuck with say a subnet inside of a zone inside of a network segment in a regional VPC, we can actually span that subnet across all of the different data centers that make up that particular zone of the network. So you've got um, a lot more reuse and control over your IP space. And then the ability within your projects, between your instances to control how you move from one set of applications in one region to another without having to go out onto the public internet to make that connection. Uh, from a network standpoint, um, this is the uh, current layout of uh, our network. Um, everything in blue is current uh, a, as a named region. And this means uh, for us that it has at least three zones um, for HA and fault tolerance within that region. Uh, and the areas in white are currently uh, coming online here um, over the next year uh, to 18 months. The real key, however, to Google's network is the fact that we own our own network. Um, everything you see in blue here is Google's layer two network that we then ride our software defined layer three network across. This includes a lot of uh, subsea cabling, a lot of cross country transit um, uh, and let dark fiber um, around uh, the United States, Europe and Central Asia. Um, and uh, it allows us to provide, and I'll show the slide on this in a second, essentially a more premium experience for transit. Normally when you deal with networks, ISPs, et cetera, everyone takes what we call a hot potato routing approach, which is I wanna get the data off of my network as quickly as possible because there's expense. With the Google network, we actually take a cold potato model because we wanna keep the data that is within our infrastructure in our infrastructure as long as possible because it allows us to curate the experience and control that software-defined network layer I was talking about across all of the regions that make up the global network. Um, there's an additional piece, and we'll get to this a little bit later, but what that also allows us to do is what we call AnyCast, which is uses BGP as part of the, the magic of how it works. But you essentially have the ability to have single IPs show up globally and yet route to the appropriate nearest pop, which takes you into the Google network. So um, funny story, um, this is one of the uh, fiber lang ships and um, one of our new subsea cables that's being installed. I think this is the new uh, Northern Europe to, uh, to Africa um, connection. But uh, this is essentially shark proof cabling. <laughs> uh, we, um, uh, this is what we call field testing. Um, so making sure that everything stays up. Uh, there are two network tiers inside of uh, Google's platform. Um, what we call premium, this is the network that I just described to you, the cold potato routing. Um, keep it in the Google network as long as possible. And we exit out into the internet only as necessary. Uh, we do have standard routing if that's the approach you wanna take. Uh, slightly lower cost, but also the SLAs and QoS and everything that goes along, along with that. Um, is uh, slightly diminished. Uh, important to note that premium is the default. And if you want to make a selection to go to standard, you have to explicitly go that direction. Going to, um, and Jake, let me know how you'd like to handle this. Um, and Margo, I know that we have both the chat going and also, um, you know, potentially a Q&A section that I don't actually have a screen for right now. Um, so I'm gonna kind of pause there for a second um, uh, after this slide. This is what I was talking about with that AnyCast routing. So we've got two users out on the internet at large that are both trying to hit a common IP. 
And yet with our routing infrastructure, because of the way that the routes are broadcast, those two individuals are brought back to different pops. Then they get put on the Google backbone and then we can move them to where they need to go. So it's as low a latency as you can get from a network standpoint to get onto the Google network. And then from there, we handle that premium layer two transport. So anything in the question space yet that we wanna dig into for anybody? Not seeing any questions at the moment, but if anybody has them, now would be a great time to throw them in. It's always good to get a little breath in. Yeah, or that. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, I think go ahead. Okay. So what you've seen so far is just the network that makes up, you know, we'll call it the secret sauce, but essentially the power of um, Google's network. Um, but really this conversation is about apps, right? Um, and when we go back and we look again that 10 or 15 year perspective, uh, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, the way that we talked about cloud was really all through the lens of infrastructure. Um, and so we talked about infrastructure virtualization, doing infrastructure as code, traditional lift and shift, um, building app pipelines, AMI bakeries uh, for images, and um, really managing our entire ecosystem on a per cloud basis. And the operators of that infrastructure primarily came from NetOps backgrounds, um, the kind of traditional DevOps with a hard wall between the two sides, right? Where the operations group was, when you're done with the app, hand it to us and we'll go manage everything for you and make sure everything stays up. Um, as we move into what I would call cloud 2.0 and cloud modernization in the, the second pass at this, it's really about the applications. And when we look at what software developers are trying to build, they want to focus on their apps, the code, and more importantly, the business value that that code brings, not dealing with the minutia of operating the infrastructure and the platform as a service behind the scenes that handles that. And where that takes us is a entire set of new requirements um, that complement and stack atop the 1.0 thinking, but really now is pivoting the focus into this 2.0 application centric approach, right? Um, quick little talk on SRE. Um, for those who have never been exposed to it, this is site reliability engineering. It's a Google concept uh, that uh, has emerged over the last decade or so. And essentially what we, developed was two things. One, a theory in, in that has been proven in practice, right? That if you spend time and money solving for 99.999% uh, uptime on a system that you are participating in a larger ecosystem that is only 98% available, those last 2% that you spent your time on, you're actually wasting money investing um, dollars operationally that could be invested in new features, new functions, new velocity, new anything. So by understanding and not just trying to go to as many nines as you can get to, but understanding the service level of objective that's, that's um, available to you and specific like within your business parameters, if let's say it's 98% and you operate at 99% for a given week, day, hour, what it means was you weren't being risky enough. Um, and by risk, I don't mean risk in a bad way, but it means you didn't necessarily deploy as many features as you could have. Because if you had deployed maybe a couple more features, you would have brought yourself from that 99% down to 98%, which is still within your service level objective. Conversely, if you go below that and get down into 97%, maybe you're being a little bit too risky and too liberal with your release schedule and hardening and all of the things that go along with that. And so it's this balance that you have between the budget of acceptable error against your service level objective that you're trying to balance inside that SRE point of view. Um, it's a very uh, important and common practice at Google. And what we're seeing is that, how do we take that philosophy and operationalize it and push it down into things like Kubernetes and container orchestration 
as part of the actual fabric and way of thinking in how you manage your workloads. So we've got all this compute that's coming out there. We all want to go and decide to be cloud native, but what the reality is that cloud native isn't really so much a thing as it is a mindset. And so what's changed over the last 20 years, in addition to what I would call the emergence of the hyperscalers of which Google is one, um, is a totally different approach to thinking. And it's what we call cloud thinking, right? And that same approach to cloud thinking can actually escape the cloud. It can escape the hyperscalers. It can be deployed on prem it can be deployed at telco edges it can um, live in in environments that we don't traditionally think of as cloud environments um, you know jake to your use case point where you have um, some you know military telemetry out in the field right one does not traditionally think of that as cloud and yet deployable edge computing that is part of a larger cloud ecosystem makes that part of a cloud environment um, at the end of the day, with all of this stuff that we've built and all these abstractions, all we're doing is making it harder for developers. Um, and we need to go in and fix that. So one of the things that um, Google learned, and this is a quick 15-year uh, uh, history lesson or 20-year history lesson, uh, Google started doing workload orchestration um, with the basics of what would ultimately become containers um, going back as early as 2003. Um, it is still the platform in its modern incarnation that we use inside of Google today. It's called Borg. Um, and by the mid 2000s, um, AWS had spun up uh, EC2 and the Amazon cloud environment with Amazon Web Services. Um, Google was working with the Linux community to start to modify the Linux kernel to basically uh, enable what became modern Docker and modern container D. Um, fast forward into the early uh, 2010s, we decided to open source Borg. And so a long scale effort inside of Google was undertaken and we took Borg, productionalized it pivoted it on its side and then open sourced it and released it to the outside world. Um, was a really cool time um, for, and, you, and many of you have seen like what Kubernetes has essentially come and um, become the de facto standard for the way the container orchestration works. But it's also moderately opinionated, but not opinionated enough. So there's a very specific Kubernetes way to do things and the way that Kubernetes operates, but it also stands up these standard APIs for how you do workflow orchestration. But everyone has their own special kind of secret sauce for doing it. And uh, it essentially allows for all that. And what we realized as the market matured after that was that there's an opportunity to put layers above Kubernetes. The Kubernetes itself wasn't enough and you needed more and we needed to get back to an environment that was really good for developers so they didn't have to think about deep kubernetes internals in order to be able to get their workloads out there in the, in the open market um so in and i forget exactly the the timing i think it was late 16 or 17 um lyft released um uh, envoy which is a sidecar proxy model um, for Kubernetes, and then the uh, we open sourced a platform called Istio, which basically is built on top of Envoy. And so, what Envoy does is within your container workspaces, your pods, you have a sidecar that's a proxy that you can uh, inject things into the sidecar and essentially control the proxy layer in and out of a particular pod inside the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, that essentially enabled the concept of service meshes. Um, and so now rather than just having a bunch of orchestrated workloads inside the Kubernetes cluster, now we can really start to truly describe a service mesh. Um, the problem, again, we're still kind of far away from where the developer wants to end up. They wanna be able to define a workload, compile, deploy, hit a button and go. And that's essentially where Knative comes in, which is as a developer, describe your workload, send it out there and let 
other layers go and figure out what is necessary to handle the deployment of the workload. And it's scaling, scaling up horizontally, vertically, and uh, even down to a zero state if nothing's being used. Um, so Istio, Knative, um, and then we announced the fact that we were going to go into a multi-cloud strategy and started taking the Google Kubernetes engine, which is our uh, enterprise grade industrialized cloud version of Kubernetes and go multi-cloud with it and allow you to run it on-prem. And what that means is instead of running it in Google Cloud, we, the first generation of this ran on uh, VMware uh, and essentially enabled VMware to be a GKE extension. Uh, and as the rest of the talk, as we get through this, I'll walk you through exactly what Anthos is and how we got to it. You know. But this is a little blanket history of how we got here. So. Um, One sec, there we go. So uh, a year and a half, two years ago now, um, so we have GKE, the G Google Kubernetes engine running on GCP. We decided to go in and build a new platform to unify all of these different open source projects as fundamental pieces of a stack, but then build them up as enterprise grade and put um, a GKE integration point of view on them that allowed you to run your workloads in Google Cloud GKE, on-prem or in other clouds. And we have uh, Anthos for Azure in preview. Anthos for AWS is GA today. Um, in addition to the expansion that we're starting to get into with bare metal and edge environments uh, with the telco infrastructures. So, what this means is that we've basically taken policy and config management, security management, ops, infrastructure, service management, and the application management, and built a portfolio of both open source technology, but Google hardening on top of it in a tight integration fabric that allows you to have a single point of deployment, single pane of glass at the control plane, and in some cases, data planes, all the way down through your ecosystem, however you need to build it out. Um, so in the case of uh, Harper, just using this as, a, as an example point here, you could have a cluster running in GCP uh, West. You could have another cluster running in AWS East, and you could be running a cluster on your own bare metal in a remote mining site in some far off location using a combination of native Anthos GKE, Anthos for AWS and Anthos bare metal. And inside of the Google console, you would see all three of those clusters and be able to define workloads, this case being Harper, um, deployed across each of those three clusters and be able to build a service mesh that scaled them up and down along with their domain curves. So the Anthos stack uh, is essentially comprised of Kubernetes as its core, uh, Istio on top of that, which is the service mesh product. Um, the interesting thing about Istio is that it runs on top of and in, in, in Kubernetes itself, but it has the ability to manage workloads that are outside of Kubernetes. So if you have traditional VMs that you want to think of as part of a larger application service mesh, you can actually use Istio to control the relationship between those VMs and each other, those VMs and workloads running inside of your Kubernetes infrastructure. Uh, so it's a little like Inception in the sense that Istio runs on Kubernetes, but is bigger and is a superset of Kubernetes in the way that it operates. Uh, Knative, which is where we get into the serverless thinking where a developer doesn't, similar to a Lambda concept, uh, where you write a workload either as a stack or as a function and deploy it out in the infrastructure and the infrastructure just handles it and scales it for you. That's where Knative comes in. And then when we talk about CI CD pipelines and what the ops strategy of the world is, that's where we get into Techman. Okay. 
So this is the open source side of the Anthos stack. We are a big contributor to all of these projects. Um, we are completely invested in making sure that the open source community on them thrives. And it is extremely important to Google's um, strategy and participation. Um, so one of the things that this gives us the ability to do is Again, I mentioned multi-cluster management. So when we spin up one of these Kubernetes clusters that is Anthos enabled, regardless of which platform it's on, uh, one of the pieces of the fabric is a connect agent. And what this essentially does is turns that Kubernetes cluster into a GKE manageable Kubernetes cluster. Um, that talks to a thing up in uh, GCP called the connect service. And you can either connect to that over the open internet, over direct interconnect via alternative proxies and the like. Um, they, we have a, one of the features of Anthos is a thing called config management. Um, this is uh, partially based on OPA. Um, you have the ability to specify essentially a Git ops um, perspective on the way we handle config management, where all of your clusters, even on all these different environments, essentially have synchronized state that's constantly validating that the state that's been applied to all the systems has the exact same config management um, into all those environments. Uh, ingress, ingress for Anthos allows us to unify the ingress patterns across load balancers, which may differ across the different plas platforms, but ingress for Anthos allows us to unify that layer. And then the connect gateway, in addition to being able to use this inside the single pane of glass in Google Cloud, also allows you to use kubectl uh, as the administration layer from a single point of view and still be able to cube cuddle into all these remote clusters as long as they have the appropriate internet connectivity. Uh, just kind of went over that. These basically two slides go together. Um, the uh, connect agent um, can operate in a disconnected state. And so in the single pane of glass, you will see that and all, all of the rules that might be running in the service mesh on that disconnected cluster still apply and everything flows through. So um, essentially these are different flavors of GKE. Um, when you go in and run uh, Anthos and deployed on any particular platform, um, kind of think of it like the 1800s with, uh, with railroads where you had different gauges of rail and not everything was unified. What these GKE layers do is they essentially unify the gauge of rail and layer more opinionation on top of these each of the particular Kubernetes installations on all these different platforms and brings them to the single sheet of music. Um, the last piece of this is a thing we call Anthos Attached Clusters. In case you do not have one of the supported platforms where we can actually inject the GKE into your particular Kubernetes environment, we have the ability to do a slightly lesser variant that's called Attached Clusters, which you go and manually add some stuff to the cluster. Let's say you're running Rancher and you still want to attach it back to Anthos. You can do that with the Attached Cluster model. Uh, go off that. Um, when you're running Kubernetes in GKE, we have our kind of standard environment. This is the console managed environment. We also have a thing called autopilot, which um, is kind of a set it and forget it. Google handles all the infrastructure, all the clusters. You just define the workloads, and we horizontally and vertically scale the clusters to support the works, the uh, deployment needs of that particular work set. Contrast that with DIY Kubernetes, which has you doing a lot of work in dealing with the internals and guts of K8, which can get a little uh, hairy at times, especially as an operator. Okay. Uh, Istio comes in on top of all of this. This is our service mesh. Uh, you'll notice here in this diagram, you see the magenta um, hexagons. That is Envoy. So Envoy sits inside of each of uh, the clusters and the pods and acts as a proxy and allows you to have interconnect between the pods running inside of a cluster or across multiple clusters. Um, the Istio control plane determines what all that looks like. So it does all the unification, essentially mixing all the policies 
deploying those policies down to the proxies, making sure that what the proxies have in, uh, in operation is set up correctly. Um, and this is all built on the concept of zero trust. So without any specific rules, none of these services and microservices within the mesh can talk to each other. So you have to explicitly set access policies, roles uh, between all the connection points. And we use MTLS between the proxies to uh, enforce um, that level of security. So Anthos Service Mesh is a product that is built up on top of Istio. And so it is the majority of the Istio uh, ecosystem and then a bunch of additional Google extensions on top of it, including the way that we visualize the information back into the GCP console, uh, the way that we pull logging metrics um, and monitoring, alerting, et cetera, for SLOs, which then reverts back to the way that we do the, uh, the container uh, balancing across the service mesh. Um, really complex load balancing capabilities um, with software load balancing pods that are in each of the clusters with the ability to do grouped aggregates on those all the way up to that global load balancing concept uh, that I talked about when we introduced the network at the beginning of the talk. Uh, in addition to that, we have a full AI ML layer that sits and watches all of the traffic across Anthos Service Mesh and makes recommendations about the way that you may actually want to modify your services fabric around what we've observed and learned. Right, on to Knative, um, on the left, what developers actually end up doing day to day, but on the right, what they would really rather do. And what Knative does, again, brings you back to that world. I write the code, I compile it, I push it out, and I want the platform to go take care of all that for me. This is what we call Cloud Run. Now we have Cloud Run today. Let's say I'm not using Kubernetes at all. I just want to go build a Docker container. Uh, I want to front it with a HTTP load balancer and I want to have Google scale that for me uh, individually. We already have that. We have built that on top of the Knative API and that's our Cloud Run product. Um, Cloud Run for Anthos takes all of that technology with Knative and goes in and puts it in on top of GKE if you're running it in GCP. Also, it puts it on top of GKE on whatever platform inside of the larger, broader, broader ecosystem. So now you have a single deployment model, even though I may be deploying on GCP, AWS, or on-prem bare metal, I can do all of that through Cloud Run for Anthos. Um, Cloud Build uh, is essentially our managed CI CD pipeline process. Again, this is uh, essentially a Google uh, enhancement of Tekton. Um, and it follows that same pattern that Cloud Run has. So we already have our Cloud Build product as a separate uh, entity from the GKE ecosystem. And now we've also extended it down into uh, Anthos uh, and Kubernetes under the hood. Uh, ACM, this was the piece that I uh, mentioned uh, with uh, parts of OPA and some other things. Uh, this is what manages between all your different clusters to make sure that their synchronized state and config management is all maintained, regardless of what platform that is running in. And then to our last piece, and this brings us back to that last point on applications about SRE. Um, by taking all of the plumbing of all the GKE infrastructures running on all of these different platforms and piping it back into cloud operations, which is the modernization of Google's uh, stack driver infrastructure that some of you may be familiar with from the, um, the past. It's still at its core stack driver. We renamed it um, a while back and have ex continued to extend it. Um, this gives you visibility and logging into every aspect of your entire operation stack from the clusters to the workloads um, and everything in between for logging, audit, monitoring, uh, and event-driven uh, action. So kind of bringing it all together here, um, if we talk about, and kind of using Harper as this use case, so um, if I have three, um, a cluster of three Harper DB nodes, or let's let's say two nodes per uh, region that I want to put together. So I've got six um, uh, Harper DB instances that are spread across three regions, 
and I've got them set up with full clustering uh, inside running in containers with an Anthos deployment with a global load balancer in front of them. So they are doing full pub sub synchronization across the uh, the Harper infrastructure. And I'll let Jake you know, speak more to the internals of the synchronization uh, from a technology standpoint on, um, on the Harper side. But what's really neat here is that by def describing and deploying these three clusters, and then connecting all of them together using Harper's internal clustering fabric, uh, we can also put a global load balancer in front of the Anthos multi-cluster deployment, expose that to any cast, and now a developer who might be writing to or consuming data, um, say from Tokyo, when they hit that IP from that load balancer, it's gonna automatically figure out that they should actually be connecting into the Google network in Osaka, where I've got that cluster set up. Same user hits the same IP from Munich, they're gonna end up in Frankfurt. Same user hits it from Northern California, they're gonna end up in the Dalles in Oregon. And a different Harper node is going to be responding to those calls, but I've only deployed a single IP that I've mapped into DNS globally to be able to enable all of that across the board. Um, so, Kind of bringing this together and again, really ticking and tying it back to Harper's use case um, as we went through this container journey. Um, there's a lot that goes into containerization and preparing it for environments like this because just containerizing the workload isn't enough, right? You actually have to think about what does it mean when I go deploy uh, whole fleets of this thing and I want them to be dynamically configured. And it's been really neat to watch the Harper team learn about um, you know, the attributes that are necessary from the internals to be exposed to the outside so that when you're taking a DevOps strategy of not wanting to actually configure each box manually, that you can do that out of the box with the way that the containers are actually constructed to enable this sort of ecosystem. And that's what they've been doing internally um, for the last month or two. So I will pause there and kind of transition us over into a uh, Q&A environment. I know we went, I just went through a lot of information very quickly, obviously in the, the time we have available. Um, but uh, happy to, field any questions that anyone might have different on any topic from network all the way up through Kubernetes, all the way up to Anthos uh, or just general GCP questions. Yeah, that was awesome. I learned a ton and I've been working with you on this stuff. So <laughs> thanks. Thank you for that. Um, while we're waiting on people to submit questions, I'll go ahead and talk about that clustering from the HarperDB side. So while you were hitting uh, and any cast IP what was going to be happening there with Harper DB in the background is each node would be configured in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion, which tables publish and subscribe. In this case, they'd be full replicas. So if I were hitting the Oregon based in the US and writing data and updating it, Harper DB would be using WebSockets through our clustering and replication technology to push those changes to the other instances in Frankfurt and Osaka. Um, and those happen based on the speed of the internet as well. We've seen replication times uh, being about 100 milliseconds uh, across the globe. So really no matter where it's going and that since it's one way that's gonna be even faster than a back and forth uh, act request. So that data will move pretty much the same time. So you can be writing and querying ac across the globe and, and gathering that data. And through the GCP platform here, it's through that single IP. So all of that is transparent to the user handled with uh, Brett's Google technology here and the Harper DB technology running under the hood. All right, I see a couple of questions. Brett, I'm assuming this one's for you. What do you think the next big thing is for Kubernetes? That is a broad topic. Nice and open-ended, I like it. <laughs> uh, I think um, at the end of the day, the um, the things that we're doing with Anthos, you know, and this is almost like an apology on, you know, Kubernetes is a completely changed the entire ecosystem and the way that we think about workload orchestration, right? And I've, prior to coming to Google, I've done a, a ton of work with Kubernetes, with Mesos, 
um, with the you know various other non Kubernetes container platforms. Um, you know, grew up over the last 15 years before that in the world of auto scale VM environments. Uh, we finally now have the truly globally distributed container workflow piece. It's really going to be the extensions on top of service meshes that are going to get further and further abstracted up the pipeline um, so that I don't have to think I'm, you know, our goal is to make the Kubernetes pieces of the infrastructure as commodity as possible, extremely powerful, but commodity and really move the value value up um, into higher level services that are making it so that the technology goes away and the business value starts to emerge, right? So the more that I, as a developer, am not looking at what's the technology feature I deployed, but what's the actual block of code and function that actually mapped to business value? And how easily was I able to deploy that business value out into the field and understand this is the investment that I made on deploying that out there. And this is what I was able to get back, even on a, like at a function by function level. It changes the way you write software. It changes the way you do requirements gathering and understanding the economics of what we write software for, which is to perform a function, right? Um, and so I think that's where really where you're going to see a lot of the maturity in the ecosystem is the stuff built on top of Kubernetes. We're also starting to see things like K3S, right? Um, and other technologies, you know, what we, the Kubernetes Lite, if you will, which is how do I have the same Kubernetes API, which we've now, you know, through the Cloud Native Foundation, things like this, those APIs have become standard contract. But now we have all of these new, you know, I would kind of jokingly used to call like the IP over carrier pigeon protocol, right? Um, there are a lot of environments. It's a big planet with a lot of big open space. And the big core backbone networks are going to be augmented by all these amazing new edge use cases. But the whole Kubernetes stack doesn't always fit in all those little smaller little places. So you're going to start to see evolution in variations for those areas. But the one thing they'll have in common is moderate adherence to the API layer of Kubernetes. So that even though my implementation might be lightweight under the hood, at the API level, it's standardized, which allows you to have these single panes of glass that deal with different modalities behind the scenes. So that's quick, short answer to- Yeah, <laughs> well, I like that a lot. I think that's a really good way of thinking. And I mean, like we said, HarperDB is going containerized. So we're putting a database that can be distributed through this. Uh, that's one example. There's all sorts of applications that can do that. Uh, I really liked what you said early on, and cloud thinking doesn't necessarily mean cloud. And I think that really is the extension of that. Yep. Uh, another question, I have a feeling this one's directed at me. Uh, what new HarperDB feature are you most excited to release? Uh, that will be HarperDB functions. I cannot wait. Uh, until we're able to get those out the door. Uh, I've been in databases literally since high school. I took relational database courses then. So I've, I've loved database and technology and the ability to layer things on top of each other. And what we're doing here at HarperDB, we're combining sort of that web application style into a database technology. And then with functions being able to let you, let end users write their own code and deploy it into HarperDB really gives you this full modular, uh, code platform database and, and really everything in between. Um, so I'm hoping to have those out in the next few months here. And I cannot wait until we're out there producing recipes, examples, having users develop on them. Uh, really, really excited for that. Uh, and I see another question came in. So list the enterprise companies that are considering to use Kubernetes to develop their next generation softwares for public use. Uh, Brett, I'll let you interpret that. Uh, and, uh, well, I'll, I'll actually, I'll answer it upside down. Um, uh, right. <laughs> I'll give you the list of the ones who aren't. Because um, the answer is, so first of all, you're, no one's ever developing specifically for Kubernetes, right? We're, we're, we're using modern software development practices and the way that we choose to deploy those applications is following all of the industry trends of, you know, microservices um, done properly, uh, you know, because to be fair, there's been um, a lot of microservice proliferation, which, which isn't 
necessarily the, you know some of the best architectural design right um it's when you're building microservice architectures you really have to think through exactly how you're going to do it but then once you've got that ready to go you need a service mesh to go in and connect all of those little legos that you built and deploy them uh, and more importantly be able to change the shape of them around the service needs of an application so uh you know you may find yourself with a 75 you know, 10, 15 uh, ratio across three microservices one afternoon and the next day it's 20, 50%, 25%, you know, um, and then 5% net new going to a new function. The application needs to be able to dynamically deal with all of those things and stacks like Kubernetes that allow you to scale both horizontally and vertically and layer service meshes on top of them are what, um, the general enterprise world today that's building first class cloud native platforms are moving towards. Um, we're also finding that it's possible to essentially migrate. I mean, we have Anthos Migrate that will analyze a existing workload and actually containerize it. So it's taking a VM and it does a bunch of analysis and figures out, is this containerizable? And if so, extract tracks everything it needs from the VM, wraps it in a container that you can deploy back, back in as containerized infrastructure. Well, that's pretty slick. Yep. All right, I think that is all the questions we have. Great. All right, yep. uh, Margo, any closing thoughts? No, yeah, I, um, thanks everyone for taking the time to tune in. As I mentioned at the beginning, we do record these, so we'll get it up on YouTube within the next couple of days and we'll be emailing it to all RSVPs, um, things like that. So let us know if any questions pop up afterwards, but really appreciate your time, Brett. This yep. was this was really exciting and um, informative and thank you both for your time. Yep, and if anybody has never used the GCP platform, um, if you go to um, and either Google uh, Google Cloud GCP, uh, or that's definitely like inception. Google ourselves. Um, so, but uh, you can sign up for a free account. You'll be given credits um, for the first period of time. Um, the, the credits vary from time to time. I'm not sure what the current uh, program is. Additionally, there's an additional service layer for Anthos. Uh, if you're looking at it for enterprise needs, uh, when you enable that trial, you're given uh, a larger block of credit than the regular free tier account uh, to actually play with and explore Anthos. Awesome. Thanks. Sweet, again. yeah. And if you, HarperDB, give it a try as well, uh, studio.harperdb.io. Uh, Kaylin just chatted those in the chat here. Um, or try us together. Uh, put HarperDB on Anthos, which is what we're, we've done, and we look forward to continue doing. So once again, thanks, Brett, and I think that's all we have. Thanks, everybody. Have a great evening. Thank you.